Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this week's Scan Pro Audio webcast. Uh, we've got something uh, really quite special for any fans of traditional synthesis. We have the very lovely Gareth Bowen with us this evening. Uh, Gareth's a professional keyboard player, a session man. He's currently working with uh, Massimo Park, and uh, he's going to be taking you through this uh, little beauty in front of me. That's the Roland Geyer. Um, those of you who watch regularly will know that we usually start the show with a couple of items of news. Um, I've been on holiday for a couple of weeks, so, um, so I didn't actually have anything with me today. And then something very extraordinary happened. Our Tom, who's, uh, who's not usually given to outbursts of excitement, uh, leapt about six foot in the air when he found out that his new toy had arrived. Um, and I say toy, that's been a bit disingenuous. It's actually one of the coolest things we've seen for a long time. And it's not available in the UK at the moment. This was the first one into the UK. We hope that we're going to be able to get them for you. But uh, I'm going to do something. I'm going to call Tom out from behind the desk and get him to explain this to you for the next five minutes because this is double cool. Tom, slide on in. Lovely. I'll go this way. Nice one. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I am going to talk to you today about this thing. This is sub pack. Subpack is a personal subwoofer. Um, you may be thinking, oh yeah, we've had these for years. And they kind of had rumble packs and rumble vests and, you know, using the same technology that you've got in your phone or your Xbox controller. Well, no. This is a membrane. The whole thing is a bass speaker. It only does frequencies between about... Ooh, lower than ooh, 80 hertz. You basically put this on the back of your chair and plug it in. It comes with the little control box. The, uh, it's got headphone output for you to connect your headphones in and a line input. It's also then got this intensity level and the intensity um, is exactly that. It controls how much of the vibrations that you actually take through into this. If you're listening to electronic music, ironically, you have it quite low and the headphones quite loud. Whereas if you're um, listening to the even, well, it even says in the manual, uh, classical or films, um, you have that quite high and then you really get the booms of kettle drums or explosions. Now, we were quite hesitant before we've heard this, and I've got to say, I've never seen as much excitement in our um, office upstairs. Everyone was coming and diving on this today, and the smiles on their faces when the track dropped and the bass line kicked in were, it, I mean, we, we've just never seen it. Much people um, shouting and uh, swearing in the office quite loudly, um, because this is next level. If you're at home trying to produce bass music, um, unless you've got a massive subwoofer, you've never got an idea, really, of what's going on at the bottom end that you can hear in many clubs. Um, this will help you. If you put this on the chair and use it even in conjunction with a set of monitors, forget headphones, run your, this with your monitors. Um, you've got, I, I checked this and it was working way down past sort of low B, which um, my Mackie sub does do, and I've got that in the studio. Uh, that cost ooh, over a thousand pounds, and you can hear it literally um, three rooms away. With this, um, I actually had it on on the train this afternoon when I was coming in to scan, and no one heard it. Um, you can hear it if you stood next to it, but realistically, in quite a noisy environment, you can get away with with doing this. Um, a couple of uh, key people um, I, I know who it have got one of the pre-production units in America. One of them's Freak Nasty. Um, Freak Nasty has basically said he, he can't believe it. He's now able to travel and work on new material in his hotel room in a way that he's never been able to do before. So this has got a massive thumbs up from us here at SCAN. We're hoping to go and get some of the first shipment uh, of the production run to come into the country. But um, I am blown away. I really am. Um, there's not very much that does that to me. I'm a very much a connoisseur. And in fact, the ultimate setup that we have had this going on this afternoon was with a pair of Odyssey LCD3 headphones, which if you've seen future music this month, 
you might be aware of the uh, rather excellent review for them. Um, the combination of the two is something absolutely mind-blowing, and I really would encourage you to go and try one of these out at the first opportunity, because it's going to revolutionise uh, home uh, production. You know, anyone who needs to hear the bass frequencies, this is just next level. Hi, I'm here at SCAN today to talk about synthesis. Um, I'm going to go through the basic structure of subtractive synthesis um, and I'm going to use the Roland Gaia. The reason I'm using the Gaia um, is for a couple of reasons. One, uh, it's a great way to actually um, go through this, the starting uh, procedure for synthesis, but also very um, intense uh, synthesis as well and also because it comes with the editing software so I can actually record um, if you had an old analog synthesizer uh, and you made a mistake you would never know where you went wrong basically uh, and with the the Gaia um, editor I can actually record every single move that I make um, so it's quite a handy thing and it also has a wave uh, viewer as well which actually shows you the different sh um, s shapes um, of each waveform so I'm going to go right back to the very beginning to start with Back in the 19th century, around about the uh, 1830s, a French mathematician uh, discovered that just as the atom is the smallest known element um, of a particle, so too is the sine wave uh, the smallest known element of sound. And it's a natural uh, wave that appears um, all around us all the time. Um, and a short period after that, um, the, the first additive synthesis, uh, synthesizer was put into production. Um, one was made. It was weighed about 200 tons. Um, but basically, I'm going to explain a little bit of additive synthesis as I get through, because when I get to the sine wave, I can give you a bit more of an example. Um, but as I said, I'm using subtractive synthesis today. Um, and the main difference between subtractive and additive synthesis is filters. Um, you have a, a, a dedicated structure of how they work. We start off with an oscillator. Um, and I'll use my mouse here to go through each different section. The oscillator is equivalent to my voice, basically. Everyone has a, a different uh, tone to their voice, um, and therefore the, the easiest way for me to explain it is to go through the oscillator. Um, the oscillator is the waveform. The filter, the second mode, is basically my mouth or my throat that's shaping the actual tone of, the, of the, my voice, so it's shaping the tone of the oscillator. Then we go through amps, which is your amplifier, but I'm going to start right at the beginning. It's very easy um, for us all to use um, preset um, s sounds on synthesizers these days, but from my background, you really need, if you want to copy someone else's sound to, d to use live or whatever, you need to know basically either how to edit a preset, an analog preset, or to actually create it to start with. Um, and that's basically what I'm going to go through today. So, in our first section here, what I'm going to do is, um, this great thing about the, uh, the Gaia, um, you normally have one oscillator that will run through maybe uh, a filter, and then if you add on some synths, you can add another oscillator, and it runs straight through the same filter. Uh, the difference between the Gaia is it has three complete synthesizers built in, uh, which is why I'm using it to show you as well. So I've got one synth there, the second synth lower down, and then the third synth. Um, but we, we're calling them tones, basically. So this keyboard is capable of running three tones through three completely different filters, amps, three different LFOs. Um, it's very flexible. We need to start off with how we basically um, create a sound. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to initialize. You can either do it on the software or from the keyboard itself. And basically just get down to a raw tone. So I just click on the initialize. And this is just going to give me one synthesizer now. The first tone we have uh, on the top, and you'll find these um, waveforms basically um, on, on all analog synths and analog model synths. The first one we have is uh, a sawtooth. And like I said, we need to be able to create sound. So we need to know basically what waveform we need to, to start with to create. So I know a sawtooth is quite a raspy sound. 
Um, and the great thing about the, 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 the rasp on that, I can think of any th a stringed instrument, brass instrument. Uh, I'm going to show you d making the different sounds in a short one. I'm just going to give you a little rundown of each different tone. So basically, if I'm making a brass or even a piano, for instance, I would use a sawtooth as my basic uh, waveform. Quite a raspy one down. The next one down is the square wave. And the square wave, um, you should be seeing the the actual waveform on the screen here as well, which actually shows you the actual structure of it. So the square waveform, um, I always think, is a dodgy clarinet, basically. So from there, I know I can create a nice sort of clarinet or solo sound. Uh, the next one down is a quite a strange one. It's called a pulse width. Uh, and the reason it's called that, it's basically a square wave, but I can actually change the width of it, and I can actually add pulse width. Um, and the speed of that is controlled via the LFO, which I'm going to come to finally after running through the, these three steps. Um, the next one down, I'll just initialize again, so as I haven't got any of the, the last setting. The next one down is the triangle waveform. If I'm creating uh, an electric piano, um, if I want to um, make a guitar sound, this sounds like the old Bon Tempe keyboard. So I know it's a good sound. So you've got that horrible raspy sound, but it's a great um, basis for uh, uh, guitars, etc., um, and also um, some keyboards. Now, the next one down is getting taking me back to additive synthesis. This is the sine wave that I mentioned right at the beginning. If you see the screen, you can see it's a very pure waveform. It only has one, harmo uh, one frequency and no harmonics. It runs at 440. This is the natural waveform that uh, is, is around us all the time. You can go really low frequencies to extremely high frequencies. And even on its own, it's been used for solo sounds. It's a nice sound um, on, on its own. Um, but additive synthesis, this was the only waveform that back in the early 19th century uh, that they had. And they realized that additive synthesis, what it meant was the more sine waves, because they're all identical, they only have like a 5% difference. Um, because you, you, when you layer uh, sine waves, you can get the effect of um, changing the frequencies. Um, so for instance, before I run on to the others, I'm just going to give you a little example of that. I'm going to use three different synthesizers. So this one and, and the second one, I'm going to run them all on exactly the same pitch. So I've got a sine wave here. I'm just going to transpose that down to concert and now I'm going to switch on my second synthesizer and I'm going to put that to sine wave and now when you hear them two together you can't hear any difference. If I run them using, um, let me just switch it on, my, uh, if I just switch this to the ringtone modulation which is putting them bang on top of each other and then switching one more on and all I need to do now is change the cutoff filters and you can start hearing different tones coming through which was basically the first ever synthesizers which obviously became organs. Hammond Organ were the first company to actually do this commercially and by ju you can instantly hear that it's lost that nice solo sound and it's now starting to sound like an organ. Um, but with the additive synthesizers, you didn't have filters. I'm going to link all three of these together, and I'm going to just use a filter sh quickly just to show you how we can change the frequencies to get different types of organ sounds. Now, on the first uh, additive synthesizers, the only way they could do that was with tone wheels, basically, all running at different um, speeds. To, uh, to, to get the, the, the more frequencies. So additive synthesis is basically you start off with one fundamental sine wave, you keep adding up, adding up, adding up, until eventually you get to a sawtooth. And it takes hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of sine waves to actually create a sawtooth. Uh, a lot of the computer's um, softwares like Zeta 3, um, they have that ability just from using the computer power, so that can actually add in other waveforms other than just sine wave. The next one down is our noise waveform. And you might think, how could I use that? I'm going to show you in a very short uh, time. And, but first of all, the last one I'm going to use is the Super Saw. This, the Super Saw was invented by Roland. It's actually basically seven 
sawtooth waveforms with the middle three detuned to give you a nice chordal effect, uh, which um, basically made dance tracks, uh, dubstep, all of those um, <laughs> sounds possible. Um, I'm going to come back to this because I'm going to have to use the waveforms now to show you the other sections. So the next section, we have our voice, we jump into the filter, um, and what you can see here is we have low pass filter, high pass, band pass, peaking, and bypass. There's various other different filters that you can get, um, but to, to explain what they do, low pass filter kills the high frequency. So if I have, if I just put this back to a sawtooth, you can see that it's killing the, the highest part, the high frequencies off it. Um, and this is also the character of an instrument as well. So Roland will have uh, one kind of um, sound with a low pass filter, then Moog can have a different type, Profit uh, sequential circuits will have a different one. Um, they all have different characters which add to the tone. The Jupiters actually, the Roland Jupiters, have all of those different four different um, versions um, of uh, low pass filters in there, so you can actually recreate from there. But then you got down to the high pass. The high pass kills all the bottom end. Bad band pass is kind of like a mid on the mixer, and peaking pass basically moves the tone, keeps the initial tone, and moves the treble and the bass around it. So you can hear the initial tone there, but I'm affecting it after that. Um, so this is, that's a basic rundown of filters. There's also a button underneath called a slope. And what that does is, if you imagine the low-pass filter and the, the way it's doing it, it's just cutting off the bit of the, t the treble, the slope will literally cut it off sharply. So you won't hear it on that um, particular tone unless I do anything to it, but I'm going to show you that um, using the noise waveform in a second. Once you've got your filter, you go to your amplifier. And an amplifier is exactly what it says. Um, it's a basic um, volume for that one tone. Um, on additive synths, if you change the different amplifier for each different sine wave, you can get even more frequencies. Uh, the sine wave is a very, very complex, though simple waveform. Um, so we've got our three structures. Now, the beauty of subtractive synthesis is when it comes to envelopes. Um, and this is where I'm going to now start using envelopes. Envelopes basically are where you affect a sound from the moment you press the key down to whilst it's being held down to after when you take your finger off the key. So to give you a, a, a rough idea of that, we've got ADSR and all synths um, pretty much have ADSR. Deca de attack, decay, sustain and release. Um, and the, uh, the attack does exactly what it says. You've got your attack. I can adjust the amount of attack that I want. The decay is to the point and you can see, um, oh, it's actually on the keyboard. There's a little diagram on the keyboard where it shows where the sound goes up to. It's maximum peak, and then the sustain where it drops down to without falling off. So I can have it drop up, go up to the maximum, and go down to the sustain. And as I said before, when you take your finger off, that's the release. So it's all the way through the sound. So if I go to release now, that's after I've taken the finger off the keyboard. So let's start making some different sounds here. Um, as I said before, the, the, the various different waveforms have different tones. I'm going to use the noise waveform first because strictly um, it's being that the, the, the noise um, waveform has no harmonics, but it has every single frequency. So what we're going to do is show you how you would use the noise waveform um, it using a different couple of sounds. I've got my waveform. It has no pitch. It's the same all the way across the keyboard. What I need to do is find a tone. So I'm going to use my cutoff filter now and the resonance, which is the color to the cutoff, and I'm going to basically find a tone, whether it be any kind of tone at all. I'll just initialize it so as I've got straight to normal. I'm going to use the resonance now. Sounds like an old radio. But I can hear a tone in there. So what I'm going to do is use the slope. I've used the low pass filter to take off some of the top. If I use the slope now, it'll kill all the top end. And instantly, we have something that sounds like a whistle. Now you can tune it up a little bit more. The trouble is now, it's still not chromatic. It's still one tone across the keyboard. There's this little tool here, um, just underneath the cutoff filter. and Basically, what that is, is key follow. 
The reason you'd use key follow normally is if you created a bass sound and it's really um, bassy at middle C, or, or just say it's really bassy at the bottom, but you lose the bass when it gets to, say, middle C, what you can do is move the filter so as the bass is spread across the whole keyboard. Um, it, it, it's just a better way of, e instead of using an EQ to get rid of bass, it's basically moving the bass frequency up and down the keyboard. But when you use it with the noise uh, filter, it does quite a unique thing. It actually turns the keyboard chromatic. If I turn it one way, it makes the keyboard chromatic the wrong way around. So, And if I do it the right way around, I now have a chromatic keyboard and I can get it tighter as well because I can think I want more attack and then I can use this to create more effects my ADSR now so I can do the submarine and then I can do the release it's a very flexible waveform and um, what I'm going to do is keep on that waveform just to show you another way using the ADSR uh, most of the old analog drum machines um, were uh, you know they obviously weren't samples and they were made in this, this the sounds are actually made in a similar way so if you have your noise you could basically use the ADSR to actually create different types you can pitch that up a little bit I'm not going to try and make a really good hi hat because it's pretty hard to do in such a short time but basically closed hi hat open hi hat and you could do the same using the, the cutoff filters to actually create um, kick drums and things like that. Um, going now to the super saw. Um, I use the super saw a lot. The super saw is um, pretty much for string sounds, pad sounds, dubstep. And I'll actually do dubstep first just to show you because it's quite a popular sound at the moment. So basically, just using one synth engine again, I'm going to initialize the keyboard and I'm coming down to the super saw, which is the one at the bottom. Uh, the guy is great because it actually has three different variations of every different type um, of waveform there. So if you can't get exactly right, you can have a mess around with uh, some of the other ones. So basically, dubstep. It's really quite simple to use. Uh, and a lot of people think it's, it's more complicated. Some people just use a cutoff filter. So if I just pitch this down, right the way down, two octaves. You could either do the easy way which is the cutoff filter which is basically just creating the tone but that's not actually allowing me to actually speed it up and slow it down unless I do it manually which is pretty hard work so basically find the tone with the cutoff filter I do use the slope again to get a nice tone but then I use my LFO and this brings me on to the, this section of the keyboard here LFO LFO is low frequency oscillation um, it's so low you can't hear it. If you imagine the C, the C has basically, uh, you have your surface waves, uh, which is our oscillators here, and then you have your uh, undercurrents, basically. The undercurrent is what's actually hitting the top of the C. So if I use the undercurrents, you don't hear it, you just hear it affecting the oscillator. So I'm going to switch. Um, again, the LFOs have different types of waveform. You, um, you've got triangle, sine, uh, sawtooth square, sample and hold, and random. And what I'm going to do now is just switch it on. And you can then make your dubstep. And I can actually speed it up then using my tempo control. Another really important part of synths is using the effects. If you'd heard the old um, 80s classics were all done on analog synths, they didn't sound that great in the raw. They all had to go through racks of effects, so don't be scared of using effects to, uh, to add to the sounds and to make them. Uh, and basically, you have a separate effects page on the guy that I'm using. And you can do all sorts of things like phaser. So I'll just put a bit of phaser on that. And there you go. So this is basically using effects in different conjunctions. I'll show you quickly now how to use uh, all three oscillators to create something like a pad. If I just come back, um, as I said, it's knowing what the waveforms sound like to start with. So again, I'm going to use my super saw. I'm going to initialize, and I'm going to create a pad using my ADSR. So if I just play the sound on its own, it's quite a musical sound anyway. 
but I'm going to cut off the top end. And most pads don't have an instant attack, so I'll take some of the attack off. And a bit of decay, drop down, that's exactly the same, but a bit more release. So I've got a bit. cut off and then I can turn the level up if I want to um, switch my effects on just to hear it so I'm going to use a panning delay because that's quite a nice one for a pad turn the level down a bit a bit of flanger and then what I'm going to do is I use a sine wave the sine wave we used before to show the solo sounds but this time I'm going to use it I'll switch the first oscillator off a second the first synth off um, just turn that off and what I'm going to do is come to the sine wave which I'm going to pitch it up two octaves just turn the effects off a second and I'm going to try and make that into a bell sound using ADSR again so it's quite simple to do all of these different things you, uh, using the cutoff now and a bit of resonance actually I'm quite happy with that so Wanted to drop off a bit more. Bring back our first sound, the pad. Bring our effects back in. And I've also got a third uh, synth, so I'll just do uh, anything on the third synth. Uh, I'll put a, um, uh, a triangle waveform on that. So I'll just switch the first two off again while I'm doing that. Come to effects, switch them off. So now I've got a nice kind of mid-tone there. And using the software, um, if you hold shift down on the keyboard, you can see on here that, I've that I'm getting various things like velocity, sensitive, that I can control. And I can also control the panning of each individual oscillator. If I just switch them back on so you can see it clearer. Uh, so shift, and now I'm going to pan the first sound to the left, one to the right and pan that to the left and now here we'll do this, the three sound like with the effects on I can adjust the levels of each different sound as well so I can turn those first two down maybe a bit more resonance on the It's a great little keyboard to do all of these different things, and you can actually upload uh, loads of sounds from the actual library, which are in here. Um, t t so you don't always have to learn everything about synthesis. Most, most keyboards will have uh, a basics uh, of sounds to work on to start with. Um, the sign th that just quickly showing you the triangle wave here. This is three triangle waves, and you can see what happens is when, when you layer the two, the three together, you even get a nice a guitar. That's all that is, it's just three uh, triangle waves. And if you want to turn that into a distorted guitar or a, a lead guitar, so all you need to do is just come to the distortion, switch it on. So it's not all about synthesis, a lot of this is actually about using different effects um, at the same time. Um, so this is basically th how we, uh, we, you know, we build up every different sound um, to create different tones. There's also other f parts of synthesis which is using uh, to, to emphasize synthesizers such as um, arpeggiators uh, and using different um, tones to actually do it. Um, but there's also other parts of envelopes. For instance, under the oscillators here, if I just switch this back to the raw tone again, I want to show you the envelopes under such things like, for instance, the pitch. So you can use pitch envelopes to actually um, edit the sound whilst it's playing, the same as um, the attack ADSR. Um, and so for doing that, I'll pick a, a, a waveform. And for instance, now I'm going to use this one here. And I'm just going to put this up a little bit. So you can hear one way I can bend the sound upwards. So I'm just going to do a little bit of a bend up. 
about 38 would be cool. I'm trying to show you on screen, but it's actually probably easier to do it on the keyboard to a certain extent. And then what I'm going to do is bring another one in using the same waveform. So I'll t um, switch the waveform down here. I'm going to get rid of the top end. Give it a little bit of bend up as well. And give it some effects. Not too much. I'm just tuning, taking the the bend to a, a, a difference. Um, what I'm going to do now is use the pitch itself on this one and just take that up seven semitones. And you'll see what I'm creating here. This is uh, like a Trevor Horn seal kind of sound. Um, this is slave to the rhythm that he used this on. So can turn it down. So now you can hear the, th the third, the seven, the seven semitones up. So there's lots of different ways of creating uh, various different tones. Um, and this is just the envelopes from the actual pitch uh, section. So then you've got your LFO section, and your LFO section has different controls again, which I showed you. I'm going to try and li uh, be a, a little bit clever, n clever now uh, to create um, a Who um, track sound using uh, the Gaia. Uh, it's not that simple, so you have to bear with me if I don't get it um, 100%. I'm going to start off raw, and I'm basically what I'm going to start off with is uh, a pulse width waveform. I'm going to take a little bit of the cutoff off it. I'm also going to use the variation uh, on this one, and I'm going to use this one because it's a little bit more metallic than the other one. Now, on the LFOs here, what I'm going to do is put it to a square waveform. The, as I said with the LFOs, it's the, the each different shape. This is the undercurrents uh, of the C pushing up against the oscillator. So the square wave is a very obvious where it cuts off diff the, the top end. So you can hear the cutoff on that now, quite obviously. Now, there's other ways of doing this. You could use the arpeggiator, but I'm just going to use uh, the, the, the LFO to, to, to produce this. I'm also going to pitch this up to uh, 24, two octaves. And then I'm going to switch the second oscillator on before I do anything clever. And I'm basically going to set this one to a square wave. I'm going to pitch that one up an octave. So we just get it to an octave. And now switch the LFO up as well. Just bring the level down. And my third one is going to be back to uh, pulse width. Pulse width is great when you're using the two together. I'm not actually using much of the pulse width in, in the actual tone. But it's got a distinct sound. So basically what I'm going to do then is link. I've got the three set up. I'm also going to have these set to variation as well, to variation green. So if I just switch the variation on this one. Eyesight's going green. And what I'm going to do with this one, oh, I'm not on square waveform there. I mean pulse width. And with this one, I'm going to pitch this up 19 sem semitones. You can already start to hear the who coming through here. Now, on the keyboard itself, what I'm going to do, is just an easy way of doing it, is link all three together. Uh, and the reason I'm doing that is to tempo sync. So now I've synced um, the uh, internal clock of all three together. And I can then get the rate. I'm going to set the rate, uh, the, 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 the ratio to 1.8 and then the rate. That's close enough for me. 78. Now I'm going to come to my effects. Again, you know, effects were used and they are very important. So basically what I do now, switch a panning delay on. 
Oh, well, I'll show you, sorry, on the ed edit screen. So I've switched the panning delay on. I'm switching the tempo sync on. And I want to get the level so it's not too much. So I've got the panning delay on. And what gives this sound away now is if I just switch the phaser on and also so this is using three synthesizers um, different LFOs from each one as I said you can't do this on a lot of synths I'm using the guy to do this so I've actually got the three synthesizers and by pitching up that last one plus 19 semitones you can hear it's really quite simple to do all of this once you start understanding how LFOs work and how the waveforms work and I could actually then go into uh, pulse with that was obviously too fast um, but it's you can get the tempo slow slow it down and the tempo sync will lock on to everything um, um, a few other different sounds that are on the keyboards just just to give you an idea because I haven't gone into much depth here when it comes to programming so I'm going to just show you a couple of the uh, um, actual sounds that you've got on here because s you can actually get some great sounds already set up for you so as far as dubstep and things like that this is one of the dubstep downloads and it automatically gives you that startup but it also shows you what synthesis can be done by literally using multiple LFOs and that's just three oscillators again all these different types on here So if you want to recreate Daft Punk or anything like that, basically you need a knowledge of subtractive synthesis to start with, or start off with a keyboard like the guy that you can actually uh, um, gives you the basic sounds on board. And the f the beauty of this one is the fact that you can actually upload all the time the different tones and then work from them. Um, a lot of colleges are tending to use this system now, be purely because of the fact that one it kind of explains how waveforms work when you actually see the waveform live. Um, and two, which I didn't show you before, was just the action list. So you can have the action list here. And this is what I was saying about when you start to record sounds, a good idea with synthesis is to understand where you've gone wrong. Um, so if I was to initialize there and set this to record, anything I do on this keyboard, it shows me every single move. And also, the beauty is it even records the time it took me to make the move. So if I hold a note down, I can go back to the top and, and it'll run through each different part that I showed. So it's a quite a good way of learning it as well. Um, I'm hoping to do some more uh, videos on synthesis, breaking it down even more uh, in the future. But uh, it's been really nice coming to SCAN today uh, to give you a basic breakdown on synthesis. Uh, and thank you very much, SCAN. How long did it take you to learn all this technical stuff? And did you learn to play before you learned the, the, the technical side of it? Or did you sort of do the two together? Or uh, No, I started off playing since when FM synthesis came in. And I didn't bother learning that because it was too complicated. Um, I learned to play first and then came on to subtractive synthesis. And to be honest, I learned it quite quickly to the certain level. And it's the one thing that is always teaching you, basically, because you know, we saw uh, Richard Barbieri um, with the, the System 700. And then when I saw that, I realized I know nothing at all. So you're always learning, basically. But to actually start off uh, the basics of learning, um, it didn't take very long. But no, I didn't start. I started off playing and then uh, um, learning how to make the sounds after that, basically. Cost too much to keep buying synths. Mm -hmm. For those of us old enough to remember, um, this this is how things were done before soft synths. And, um, and in a lot of cases, you had to actually just get in and get physical with it to try to emulate the sounds that you were trying to copy. But um, 
if for nothing else, I think the guy is absolutely superb for that. It's a return to old school sort of synthesis, and it, uh, this software makes it so much, so much easier to do as well. Um, so if we no more questions from Tom, which I don't think we have, um, thanks to everyone for watching. Again, big thanks to Gareth. Yeah, he did a great job. Um, and if you have any requests, anyone you want us to uh, talk to to see if we can bring them along and do, do a webcast, remember, please feel free to contact us. Get in touch. Uh, next week, I think we've got the guys from Propeller Heads with Nectar, but uh, if you look at the website, you'll see that uh, coming into play over the next couple of days. It'll start to tell you what's happening then. Uh, for the meantime, that's all we have for you. Uh, thank you very much, and see you next week. Cheers.